All right, let's get some questions, and then we'll sort of come back. And I, I've got plenty more, but do we have microphones? Sorry, um, I have two questions. One, um, you mentioned bidding for jobs, and I was just wondering if you have any tips for doing that, because I think that's a multidisciplinary skill that can go kind of across board. So if any tips as far as doing that. And also, like, I had a very short exposure in production, and it was by far the worst experience I've ever had in my entire life, worst internship. And I was just wondering, as far as um, being in the industry, I feel like it's very, um, there's a lot of confrontation. And I was wondering if you had any tips for dealing with that and kind of like your worst experience as far as like bidding for a job, but also that balance between fighting for what you believe in, but also like making your biz business work. So as far as confrontation in the industry, like do you have any yeah, advice on Yeah, there's that? some confrontation, but so much of it is passive aggressive people who like, you know, some directors are like ADD, cocaine addicted, can't really deal with any kind of like slightly Asperger's people. <laughs> and so, um, so confrontation often isn't so direct, but, um, but I'm pretty direct. I'll just, it, it's very much a political game and uh, knowing how to say something in the right way. And David's been great at kind of coaching us because he grew up in the industry. Um, but we have good cop and bad cop at our studio. So I'm often the bad cop. I don't mind being that part so that Matthew and Ian or David can be the good cop and uh, that helps uh, with saving relationships and um, and then in terms of bidding bidding is really really important in fact I'm still very involved in bidding because it's at the bidding process where we're choosing methodologies and making assumptions and basically creating a plan for each project so it's it's actually really really important to be able to estimate time like most people underestimate their time like if you do group work by half <laughs> like people just don't know how to estimate your time and it's practice like the more you do it the better you get at it, it becomes a language like man days are a language and I always tell people like you're creative and you have to estimate your time and if you can't estimate your time then you're not a professional in this industry so develop that skill and um, you know often we'll get one in ten bids we'll bid for months or we'll have clients say like don't make me take this to Canada because there's tax credits and we're like that's kind of our threat like you'll have to go to that other competitor because they're just not going to do the work that we do and uh, have confidence in yourself but bidding is super important and then scope creep on your projects is very dangerous like like I was talking about like when things change like learn to to be aware like of that moment of change and raise flags like raise yellows and oranges, not just reds. And I tell our employees that because there's one guy that comes to me and they're all red flags. And then he'll, I'll come back to him like, how's it going? He's like, oh, I handled that. Like, like just kind of, you know, communicate a little bit more on that because I'm like out trying to help fix the problem. But um, with clients, it's really, really important to say like, okay, w especially with the director, like, okay, you know, take notes and say, well, we'll take a look at that. And then immediately turn to the producer, like, that's probably going to cost more money. But, you know, we're going to go back and evaluate that and send you an update. And, per and studios are fine with change. And often people who hire you are fine with changes. They just want to be part of the process. So often there's like the people who fail upwards. Most of those people are just really good at communicating change. So be really good about bidding, but then also about communicating change as it comes along and go back for change orders. We're like a fixed bid. And then as everything changes, we'll go into a change order. And there's give and take. Like certain projects we invest money into. Like Aviator is a good example. They, for as big a budget film as that was, they felt it wasn't a visual effects film. And we're like, oh, no, there's crashing planes. This is a visual effects film. And um, so we did kind of like the supervisor on the film was fantastic. And it was like pulling out every trick in the book. So sometimes having not a lot of money is helps you be more creative because you have to figure it out you have to exercise those creative muscles but um, bidding is really important and we have I think that's part of why we're still here is um, every person who does what we do you talk to them there's always like that one job that almost put them out of business and just being willing to go back for changes and raise those flags is super important uh. How did you deal with it being such a uh, scalable company, going between 15 and 100 and however many people you said? How do you deal with managing that type of dynamic? We, um, well, first we hire really good people. And particularly in production, um, you know, you'll hire your key department heads and they bring their team so they manage their team. But also 
treating people, like I said, common courtesy and respect. And on our side, we are fanatical, not just about creating great content, but managing our resources really well. So we're very good at um, just managing the money and the time and you know, protecting people, and that's also um, part of it. We're just really on top of it. Hi, my name is Caitlin. Thank you for coming tonight. And I know your team and you work under tight deadlines and time constraints. And how do you handle that pressure? Oh, lots of different ways. Um, well, one, we try to manage it so we to, to minimize that as much as possible. But then, like, when it gets really bad, you just go and blow off some steam. Like, we'll get in a room, the three of us, and, like, complain to each other and just kind of vent. You have to, to have that time. And... Um, you know, it's like, don't, don't fight Mother Nature, just manage it. So just allowing yourself, like, okay, go run around the block or go for a walk and come back. And, and that comes to confrontation. Like, I, I believe there's positive confrontation. And we're human beings. We get emotional. So it's like, okay, go be emotional over there and then come back and we'll talk about the issue. And just kind of get past that hurdle of emotion so that uh, you can be effective. And it can be emotional. You're an artist and, and you're giving of yourself to a project and when you know you work on a shot and um, give of yourself to a project and then it changes of course there's going to be emotion that goes along with that you know so it's important to acknowledge it get through it and move on hi thank you so much for coming I was wondering what quality do you think made you successful in this business? And also, what's your advice for us who are trying to break into the entertainment business and how we can kind of achieve success after we break in? Uh, what helped make me successful, uh, just like so much of it is tenacity and working hard and being like kind of OCD, really anal about getting all the details right. And in terms of breaking in the industry, just go work as a production assistant. Pick the area that you would like to go into and then um, kind of be fanatical about getting into that place. I had a friend that wanted to work at Disney. He moved here from Virginia. He was in finance. So he took a finance job at whatever company he could get a job at and spent six months like wooing the HR department at Disney. And they finally hired him in finance at Disney. And then he worked his way up and finally moved into animation. And now he produces films in animation. And so he just, he just worked it and had a goal and, and was very clear. and. Um, and so wherever you want to be at whatever part of the industry, that's where I suggest you start because you're going to build your network and um, the film industry is very much like who you know and who you've worked with. And like I was saying, we go on to like all the Christopher Nolan films and all of the Martin Scorsese films. And part of that is that we have a shorthand. They know like what they can expect from us. There's a t level of trust and also that we have a, s we can kind of, filter and anticipate their needs. And so I think that's really important is anticipating needs, going above and beyond and working really hard. And also like being part of the fun, like when it's stressful, it's nice to have somebody who jokes around and like can make light and bring some positive fun energy to a situation. Hi, thanks for coming. I was thanks. just wondering if you could uh, tell us what your favorite big budget and low budget films are in general or fl yeah. films we've I mean worked specifically, on specifically like which uh, just like as a movie fan like as a movie yeah. fan like in the last class they asked me like when when you were like younger what was your favorite film um, I, I have so many that I love and for different reasons it's hard to pick one but when I was a kid I loved Ghostbusters because I love comedy <laughs> so there's a lot of visual effects and a lot of comedy certainly like most people Star Wars and Indiana Jones and recently like I truly um, love like the Dark Knight and like I mean we're lucky we work on so many great films and um, uh, and so they're like uh, they all kind of have a special place, place for me but uh, like low even lower budget independent films that we get to work on um, can be a lot of fun because then you create a true like back and forth creative relationship with the director and the producing team and you're part of the process and um, so we love doing independent films where we can come in and, and really help be part of uh, making their dreams happen as well. So it's hard to pick one. And it's very cool to go to her office and then you, go, you just walk out back and the garbage truck from Dark Knight is sort of right there in full scale. Who had a question? Um, 
Hi, my name is Jacob. Um, thanks for coming. Uh, I want to ask you, how does a, like a business student go into the entertainment industry? Like, what was, how do you like get to it, and how do you meet a Hunter and Gretzner? Like, how do you decide, hey, like these guys are just those you know, are the ones. I was working with Matthew. I'm actually married to Matthew. <laughs> but small people, disclosure. small disclosure. <laughs> yeah. But we actually moved here together. Like, I'm actually. Monday was our anniversary, so it was like 22 years, so like older than you guys, um, together and 12 years married. But uh, we moved here together and we had a friend. And, um, but it's very business like often people, and my mom works for us as well, and my cousin had worked for us, and because um, they were my two favorite people. And people just, they have no idea that they're family because business is business. Like uh, people will come and work for months and have no idea that Matthew and I are married. And, uh, and I do that on purpose. Like people treat you differently if you're married in a business. They still do. Um, but also, like, it's business. It's not personal. And uh, so, in full disclosure, I was working with Matthew, and Matthew had hired Ian on a project. And that's how I met Ian. And Ian is pretty amazing as well. And it was just, it was just like good timing. Like, I was on my way to law school and decided, like, this opportunity came up and we took it. In fact, like one of my favorite things is negotiating contracts still with all the studios because like, you know, they're people. And, and, and that's another thing, like your attorney, like your advisory board as an individual or as a company owner, like attorneys and accountants are people and they make mistakes. So don't trust them completely, like question them. You know your business better than they do and uh, be part of that process is something that I would suggest. Um, hi, I'm Shelby. So um, obviously like your company relies heavily on technology. Do you find it hard to keep up with the latest and greatest stuff? No, because I'm a geek and I'm following <laughs> it anyway. Uh, in terms of investing, like as a company, like investing in technology and um, how to work with that is we'll often buy like just below the latest thing and then kind of work with it for two years and then sell it off and buy and just cycle it through that way. And we keep it simple. Um, we have an amazing IT, kind of our CTO, essentially. And working with um, Celeste, my mom, who's just as big a geek as I am, uh, we just keep it simple. Keep it as simple as you can. And we got rid of, we had like a whole like Linux, you know, kind of backbone to our, our systems and we got rid of it and went all Apple. And since we did that, it's like we saved so much money in maintenance on that. And some people are like, oh, Apple's, you know, cost more, and they don't really. It's, and, and we've never really had anything go down, and um, it's just we've been very fortunate. So I don't really find it to be that challenging. S speaking of technology, Shannon had one of the coolest cars in Cal. Oh, yeah. She's one of a handful of people who had this car. Tell, tell them about the car that you had and had to give back. Yeah, I sadly had to give back. I was... Um, electric mini uh, pioneer number 91 so i uh i like had seen this ad about electric that mini was doing a test with an electric car and so i like went online and put my name and then they had this questionnaire which was amazing and um to filter it's so important to filter people <laughs> like it crashed halfway through and it gave you the option like you know screw this or go back to the beginning no sweat and like they were test totally testing us and, um, and so then I, I finally received my Mini, and uh, it's so great. Like, I love electric cars, and they're so quick and smooth and fast and wonderful, and I can't wait for more electric cars to come out in the market so I can buy one because I'm driving a gas-guzzling <laughs> SUV right now, which is very difficult. But it was a test car, and I had to give it back after a year, but I loved it. So electric cars coming out this year, next year, and the year after, I highly suggest it. Dave's a geek too. He loves technology and electric cars. Hi, um, my name is Abby. Thank you so much for coming today. And you've talked a lot today about you know how important your people are, how they can do you know the work of three or four, yeah. um, you know of the average folk. Um, how is it that you choose these really exceptional people, and how can you separate them from other candidates like during your recruiting process? The interview process. Um, well, we're pretty fortunate because we do cool stuff so everybody wants to work for us so it, or so many people come to us and we we generally have a big uh, group to choose from but I can tell like by the time I shake your hand often whether I'm gonna hire you it's just a feeling like one of the things Dave was talking about is culture 
It's like you create a tribe and a culture in your company and then hire people that are similar. And that's okay. You know, every business is different. Like when I was in college, I was director of operations for a company and this um, business owner was a challenge to work with sometimes. And, and he used to say, it's like my bleeping company. If you don't like it, leave. And, and I was just like, okay, <laughs> you know, like, aren't we here for the customer and for building the company? And, and he was right. It was his company and he had a choice to create any uh, environment that he wanted, no matter what the result. And, um, and so uh, creating a solid culture and then hiring also for that culture, I think is important. I, when the gentleman that I introduced as the alumni entrepreneur of the year after me, he said, I always hire you, like, are you nice? Now can you do your job? And I'm like, oh, me too, that's how I hire. Like, it's really important to, to hire people um, that fit within your company culture. So that's part of it. And then you put them like through hoops, like have people jump through certain hoops to get to you and see if they make the effort. And even just for a meeting uh, or a coffee, I think it's like jump through the hoops. Like people will put little barriers for you <laughs> and see how you do. And even like I was recruited to um, work at ILM, like one of the things I can say is volunteer. And when you volunteer, do that work har harder than if you're getting paid. I worked at the, I kind of volunteered with the Visual Effects Society and I was on the board. And through those relationships, when the president of ILM left to go run Pixar, he referred me for a job there. And so when I went up to um, interview, I was talking to the, uh, um, to the chauffeur. And he's like, yeah, they call me and ask me what it's like, how you are in the car. And, and there's a famous story of somebody who was being considered to be the president of uh, Southwest Airlines. And at every point that he made in the trip, they, at, they talked to those people and to see how he was, and he didn't get the job. So, and how you are on the phone, like I said, it's all tells, like to me, it's the little things that count. And uh, there's a great process you should look up, especially since you're gonna be hired, called top grading. And it was Jack Welch's guy, um, Brad Smart, who created top grading. And um, so people will top grade you, which are like three hour interviews. And they try ask you questions to have you reveal things about yourself, because there are people who interview well, but aren't good employees and people who don't interview well, who are stellar employees. So it's just important to know who you're gonna hire and recognize that talent. And the other thing is, like people, you're either talented or you're not. Like I've never seen anyone gain talent. You can develop skills and um, you know, learn methodologies, but I've never seen anyone become like a more talented artist. So that's something to note. And why I say you can't commoditize creativity. There are only so many people in the world who are really amazing artists or scientists or coders, and um, those are lucky people. Hi, I'm Alisa. Thank you for coming tonight. I have two questions. One, um, to what extent do you think you've changed when you were in school and then you, you know, went to the working world? And then um, what are your other interests outside of your job? Got it. Uh, to an extent, I haven't changed much. I still feel like I'm 18. <laughs> You know, like I had a, uh, an aunt, she turned 75, and she's like, help me, I'm an 18-year-old trapped in this 75-year-old body, you know, and uh, so not much sometimes changes, but, uh, you know, just developing skills, and, you know, I, one of the things, it's, I'm pr I was telling Dave, like, I'm pretty shy, and I, my mom would put me, like, take me and force me to do things to get out of my shell, and I've spent years just chipping away at that like fear of speaking in public or um, like going into an event by yourself and start talking to people um, and you know at some point I hit a tipping point of like being more excited to come into a room and talk than being nervous and um, so that's changed a great deal and um, and I'm just so much better like what's funny is like I'll check in at a place on Foursquare and then I'll see other people and I'll walk up to them like oh hi how are you like <laughs> that helps so um, that I've changed that way. And then what was your other question? Um, what are your other interests? Oh, other interests. I love photography since I was a kid. I, I have done everything, taught myself to draw and paint and all, but I love photography. I'm still like my iPhone. I'm, I think I have 3,000 photos on my iPhone. So I love photography, sailing, I, cycling. I've been doing a lot of, of cycling. So those are my other interests, but I love to work. So like, well, 
some people may not find it fun. I find that fun, and I'd rather be doing that than many other things. So um, often, that's what I'm doing. And um, that's just who I am. She has many interests, and if you follow her on Facebook or Twitter, she is <laughs> such a great source for so much information. I mean, I like stay ahead for articles on this class. I get half of them from you. Mm -hmm. oh, so uh, she's always posting stuff about business, about sort of different ways of looking at things, different business models, technologies, a big post of yours. Um, I wanted to, do you have another question over there? Uh, I I'd, I'd, uh, wanted to touch on a uh, question about getting into the business. Oh, yeah, um, I forgot to answer that. No, no, you answered it, but I was just going to say, talk about the importance of of finding good mentors as opposed to just joining a company maybe because it's a really impressive name and it'd be good on your resume, but looking for people that have an interest in your future, an interest in your well-being, an interest in your development, and, and how you sort of incorporate that into your philosophy at work. Uh, I have many levels of it, mentors from like just people who are writers and books and um, believe it or not like I come back and talk to professors all the time and they're still mentors and at the networking day Warren Bennis had a good <laughs> saying he's like stalk your mentors and um, so I have a little bit of that like Midwest modesty and I wouldn't presume but now I'm doing much more of that like stalking people and asking them questions and and participating and thanking them. Like there's one gentleman who I know that I worked with at the Visual Effects Society and um, he owned a company called Pacific Data Images that he launched and he told me his story of like working um, through the ups and downs of that company. He eventually sold it, sold it to DreamWorks and it became DreamWorks Animation. And, um, and so just chatting with him and I, I send him thank you notes all the time. Uh, so mentors come in many shapes and sizes and you never know and I like I had dinner with some students last week and learned a great deal from them and it's uh, it's like really becomes irrelevant your age and where you come from and what you do you just never know what you're gonna learn but um, I learned I got a lot out of books particularly early on when I got out of school and like I said like certain companies um, you know choose for the culture like interview them as much as they're interviewing you to see if you're a good fit on your side, I think is equally important. And ask people for help, like coaching. You need coaching your whole life. I had a great CEO coach for a while and um, he helped me a great deal. And you just never know, like Tiger Woods, like one of the examples, I do a lot of continuing education just for fun. I, had, I was reading Fast Company Magazine, which is one of my favorite magazines. And I read about this like continuing education like certificate program at MIT. I was like, ah, oh, this sounds great. I want to go. So I like applied and I went and everyone there like, oh, are you an EO? Like, I'm like, what's that? The Entrepreneur Organization, which I didn't hear from, from USC, so I tell every student about it. But, um, and, and then like from there, you can have mentors, uh, like we, they have uh, chapters, local chapters in the Entrepreneur Organization and then you have smaller forum groups. So we have like a group of 10 entrepreneurs that get together and there's like a high level of confidentiality so you can really share. And when people come from all over the world to LA, they're like, oh, I'm from like Dubai and I'm coming to LA, can I come visit? So you, you, there's lots of ways to learn. And even like people I love, I follow on Twitter. Like I find interesting and you, they post really interesting things and com comments. So there's so much information out there and just, making an effort, like bothering is a big, big point. You made a good point in, in entrepreneurship and in life and in the entertainment business, shy, shyness is not rewarded. No. It's not something that really sets you apart if you're trying to get into those businesses or you're trying to start one of your own. So stick with things, perseverance. Some other, you know, as we sort of close up, what are some of the, some of the things that you would tell you know, you were in this chair a few years ago. Yeah. Looking at a speaker. And something to take with them as they think about starting a business, as they think about this next step in their lives and sort of, you know, it's been a tough economy while they're in school. It's sort of challenging right now. Jobs are, good jobs are sort of tough to come by. What are some of the things you'd tell them about the entrepreneurial life and something that they can take with them if they aspire to start a company? Um. You, uh, you know, go for it, like take the leap, because it's so important to just start. 
And one of the things I love that's going on right now in business is like a total redefinition of failure. Like to me, failure is just not doing, but fail small and often. Like the people like in Silicon Valley, th there's like whole discussions of people like it's like badges like oh I failed at this company, this company, <laughs> this company, and they know that it's just a percentage like that. Um, they'll get to success and they'll use those experiences to learn and build on and leverage for their next venture and. I think that's really important. So many people, and there's like insecurity and fear of failure. Like everybody's insecure. And uh, we, I had done some exercise in the entrepreneur organization where we all like wrote down like what our insecurities were, and then we passed the paper around. And I'm like, wow, they all have the exact same <laughs> ones. And I'm like, okay, so we all are. And that for me, I was just like, okay, I feel insecure. Now get past it. It really helped me just get past that. And then. Uh, Failure is another big one that like, I talk to people about, and they're like, oh, yeah, that totally makes sense. I love that. So there really is no failure, and there is no perfection. Just do it and, and make it work. Like, that's one of the things, like our company, we started out doing one thing, and it evolved, and it evolved again, and it evolved again. And just being willing to let go and pivot and change, uh, because one thing that's consistent is our talent and you know, kind of like base structure of what we do, but we, we're constantly making changes to the tools and the process and um, along the way to j just make it better and more efficient. So great points to make and to remember. And I actually think of my, my own point of view on, on failure. And you're in a great spot of life right now. You really don't have much downside. I mean, granted, you might have some student loans. You might be you know, starting a job. You might, you, you know, if you've got a family and some people to sort of help you out, you got a little bit of a safety net. So, what really is the worst thing that could happen if you started something or you tried, they took a risk? And, I, and I'll tell you, you know, I'm 25 years ahead of you in age, not in maturity. <laughs> and, and I'm with you there. <laughs> I don't think I've failed enough. And it, at my age, fear of failure is much larger, I think, and formidable. Because, you know, oh, I'm going to be embarrassed. I'm going to be this, I'm going to be that. Yeah. I'm, I'm getting over it. But I think if you fail early, you get accustomed to it. Not that I'm, I'm not running out the door. I can't wait to fail tomorrow. I don't want my next thing to yeah. fail. But, but getting over that, as she said, it's not looked upon as this you know, scarlet letter that you wear. And actually, for most successful business people, they, they attribute much more merit and significance to, to failing. Because you learn way more in failure than you do in success, right? What's harder? Where do you learn? When things are hard? Or do you yeah. learn when things are sailing? So uh, I, I, I really feel strongly about that. And the longer you go without failing, I think it's tougher to start things. Because you have this expectation that things should be really smooth and that you shouldn't fail. Yeah, well, Warren Buffett says if you're not like failing a little bit, you're not trying hard enough, or your dreams aren't big enough. And then um, even with startup, your startup phase is your test phase. So if you have an idea and you go and you try it out and it doesn't work out, you start another, like you'll learn something from that and, and can make, evolve the company. Like Instagram is a great like example. I was watching an interview and they're like, well, we started out as this, and it wasn't quite working, and we couldn't quite communicate it clear enough. And then, as we kind of like developed the company, and it became really just social sharing of photos, then it became clear, and we moved forward very quickly, and money came, and and so that's a point of view. Uh, it's it's a good one, and it's tough to trust in it, though. That's the part that that sort of gets you. Is like, do you really gonna trust that you're out there, not just on the ledge, but you know, we we talk about figuring out the why and the what now and the how is the you know the strategy part of it is sort of the second part but you know figuring out why you want to do something and what you want to be and having that strong vision uh, has to pull you it has to be strong enough emotionally and vivid and yeah. powerful for you to pull you but you know it uh, it the, the how part of it becomes important but if you trust in the process that you know, sort of figure out the how as we go along. Oh, absolutely. Like, I didn't, like, know film or effects when I started, but you learn and you ask questions and you pay attention. And, like, I have a cousin who's very critical of the company she works for. And I'm like, well, start your own, because she's very entrepreneurial. And she's like, well, what would I do? And I'm like, if you don't have a vision, you shouldn't be starting your company. Like, it's really important to also have a vision and even 
it's like that entrepreneurial bet. It's you know like how to fix it, how to, to work with it. So if it's a good idea, it's almost too late. Mm -hmm. you know, but if you see something that somebody else doesn't see, then you'll likely make something out of it. Yeah, that's good advice. That's good advice. I, uh, it, it's fun to be in this class because of, for me, because it sort of at that, even though we're a little bit older, we're sort of going through the same process of sort of like figuring out what's next and, and going through that cycle of what drives me, what moves me, um, getting past the failure, getting past the insecurity. So it's, it's, it's bizarre how quickly time passes from the time that we sat here to the time that we're sitting here. Yep. And the two things that you sort of touched on that friends have shared is one, it's all plumbing. I love that saying, meaning she just said like she didn't know anything about film when she started it. I didn't know anything about environmental drilling when I started that company. I, I, there's not a subject about which I know less than environmental drilling. But a friend of mine said it's all plumbing. Even the most sophisticated things are pretty simple when you start doing it, you know what I mean? You know, it's not rocket science. Yeah. Those things are really difficult. Rocket science is difficult. Brain surgery, probably pretty difficult. The rest of it, it's not as daunting as you think. And then the other part is there are very few experts when you really think about it. Everybody sounds smart. Everyone seems like they mm -hmm. have a lot of experience. But the way things are evolving so quickly, particularly in new media, yeah. you guys almost have an advantage in that versus someone five or ten years past you because they're trained on the old system and you're coming Correct. in the new system. And it's hard to change and let go. But there's like two stages to change, like fear and then excitement. So as we make changes, I try to get people through that fear as fast as possible and into excitement um, because it is changing. Like a lot of people in film have a hard time with their emails, you know, or like look, pulling something off an FTP site. And it's like, really? <laughs> this is what you do for a living. Like, okay. But um, that's why it's tools are, you, it's important to constantly update and change and grow. And um, I always feel like there's room for improvement always. So that's just part of who I am and what I bring to our company. And, and as a friend, I appreciate how much you share with your friends because I, I look to you and you provide so much stuff to me that I can use in my life and in my business just uh, through postings. And oh, she's always the one sending, oh, I saw this article, I thought it'd be interesting to you. And it's always spot on. Yeah. So thanks for sharing that stuff. Um, it's been, yeah, I think I've known you for like 10, 12 years. And it's funny, I asked like three years ago, are you married? Yeah. You didn't, because she always talks about Matthew, and I yeah. didn't even know. And after being friends for eight years, that she was married, um, so she does sort of, she does sort yeah. of protect that veil pretty, pretty uh, closely. He's so much more of a companion for me. Like, um, I grew up in the time of after-school special <laughs> movies of divorce, so I didn't so much like the definition of marriage. And um, so I think the like life partner is so much more <laughs> appropriate, and so that that fits for me. So I rarely like refer to him as my husband. It's like very strange to say that actually. So, um, but I like life partner. It's so much more fun that way but for me. But you say partner and it's in a business context. So I thought it's your partner. And then I didn't realize he's your partner uh, after you yeah. go home too. So that was, <laughs> yeah. that was a revelation. And with that, it's like anything. It just works or it doesn't work. People are like, oh my God, how many hours do you work together? And then you like live together too. And it's like, it just works. And often I never see him throughout the day. So it, it really isn't an issue, but um, we do keep it very business. And so much of that comes from my background with like my dad and, you know, like my dad and my grandfather are little Asperger's, so I am too. And like, uh, it's just, you know, you, you kind of play with the cards you're dealt. And so uh, it's easier for me to do that. And um, it, it, it isn't an issue. And sometimes it is, and then you address it and then you move on, and it's like I said, it, it either works or it doesn't, so it happens to work. Well, thanks for sharing your advice, your story, your journey, and coming back to SC to pay it forward to the next generation of entrepreneurs. Let's hear it for Shannon Blake-Lanning.